Genesis over the last couple of years, actually, uh, we have seen the patient love of God in dealing with sinful mankind. We see the marvelous creation in the opening chapters. We see the fall of man. We see God promising in Genesis 3.15 the coming Redeemer. All the way back to Adam and Eve. And then we see man continuing to rebel against God. We get to Genesis chapter 10 in the table of the nations. We then get to the call of Abraham in Genesis chapter 12. And we see the life of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and Jacob's 12 sons. We come to the end of that narrative today. In Genesis chapter 50, the last few verses of that very key important book, the book of beginnings. Every major doctrine that is found in the Bible throughout has its origin in the book of Genesis. Every major sin that we see finding its way through the pages of Scripture has its origin back here in the book of Genesis. Every provision that God will make is given to us in promised form in the book of Genesis. It's a fantastic 
incredible beginning to the Bible. And next week, the Lord willing, we're going to be talking about how it also parallels the bookend on the other end of the Bible, the book of Revelation. The things that you see in Genesis promised and lost, we find regained for us by our Lord Jesus Christ as we look at the book of Revelation. God begins and God ends. God does what he will at the beginning and man falls into sin. And we see through the pages of scripture the horrendous cost of sin. We find the redemptive work of Christ. And then we find the consummation of all things. As we get to the book of Revelation where God keeps his promises. The promises that he makes, he always fulfills. Tremendous, tremendous truth. And on that subject of Genesis, I want to mention one other thing. In your bulletins, you have a full-color insert for the Creation Conference that is coming up here on November 13th. We have a very bright young man by the name of Derek Isaacs. He's an author, he's a film producer, he's the representative for Creation Ministries International. He's going to be with us all day, Sunday school, Sunday morning, Sunday evening. His topics are there, but we didn't just give this to you so you'd have something pretty to look at while the sermon gets dull, because there are lots of good questions up there. Does God exist? What about evolution? Was Darwin right? How can a loving God allow suffering and death? What about the age of the earth? Do dating methods prove the earth is millions of years old? Who was Cain's wife? How did Noah fit the animals on the ark? Was there any real worldwide flood? Does any real scientist believe in creation? Are there any missing links? Can't a day mean millions of years? What about natural selection? Where did the races come from? What about distant starlight? Are UFOs real? Did God use evolution? What about the similarities between monkey and human DNA? What about the Ice Age? Were Adam and Eve real people? Who cares what I believe about origins? Don't fossils take many millions of years to form? What about dinosaurs? <laughs> you know, there are people out there who don't know Christ because of the lie of evolution. That's standing between them and trusting a living God because they say, in fact, as I shared with you last week after having gone to my 45th class reunion, I have a good friend who was a vibrant testimony in high school and who now because he was brainwashed with evolution when he was in college and seminary, he now no longer believes the gospel of Christ. He's become, in his words, an atheist. Dear people, this is a critical issue and this is what Satan is using to attack the church today. And it's one of the key reasons why literally thousands and thousands and thousands of young people from Bible-believing churches have canned their faith, thrown it into the garbage can, and walked the way of the world. So the reason we gave you these is not so that you can take them home and put them in a drawer. Please, take this insert and find a grocery store or some public place where you're allowed to post it and put it up and invite your friends and neighbors to come and hear the truth of God's word as it is clearly demonstrated by the scientific evidence which has not been polluted by the evolutionists around us from a man who can answer the questions from a man who knows what he's talking about we encourage you to be here November 13th, all three services. And so that is in your bulletin. And we are finishing up the book of Genesis today. It is the book of beginnings. It's the book which tells us the way in which God created the heavens and the earth in six literal days and rested on the seventh day. But now we come to the end of the book and we find the failure of man. You know, last week we looked at the portion right before this and the message was entitled, A Message from Your Father very important message because we saw that we also have a message from our Heavenly Father. It's a message that is to be passed on just as this message was passed on to Joseph here. We find the brothers coming face to face with the stark reality of death and that's how the book of Genesis ends. It begins with life. It ends in death. And if you and I do not have promises of God which are true and amen, then we have no hope when we face death. Did you look at the way the book of Genesis begins and the way that it ends? Four words at the beginning, four words at the end. In the beginning, God is how it opens, how it ends. The coffin in Egypt. 
I think that perhaps there is no more stark contrast anywhere in the Word of God than the opening verse of Genesis and the closing verse of Genesis. How far are the mighty fallen? And dear people, that's where all the world around us is ending. A coffin in Egypt. The scripture pictures Egypt as the world, what the world is like, under the control of Satan. And Pharaoh is often used as a picture of Satan throughout the prophets. And all around us, people are dying and going to hell because they have not trusted Christ and they have no hope because we sit silently in our houses, silently in our cars, silently get to church, sit there silently, silently drive back, silently sit in our houses. And they do not know Christ through us. Jesus said, Ye are my witnesses. What are you doing with Jesus Christ? What are you telling others around you about Him? A coffin in Egypt. Joseph dwelt in Egypt, he and his father's house. Joseph lived 110 years. We think, boy, that's a good long life. I sure would like to live 110 years. But in the end, verse 26, Joseph died being 110 years old and they embalmed him. <laughs> what a difference between embalming and resurrection! The world embalms! Christ raises from the dead. The world makes the casket so beautiful and the departed loved one so pretty with all the makeup and all the lipstick and all the nice clothes and the eyes closed and the hands that rest on the chest. But then the coffin is lowered into the ground. The best that the world can do is embalm and hope that the body is preserved for a while. In Egypt they were very good at it. There are still mummies of pharaohs that are making the gawking circuit today where people stare at the dead, mummified corpse of a dead pharaoh. Which would you prefer? Embalming or resurrection? The world will embalm you. How pretty. Jesus Christ raises from the dead. What contrast we see as we look here. Joseph died being 110 years old and they embalmed him and he was put in a coffin in Egypt. As I said a few moments ago, there's probably no greater contrast in all of the scripture than that opening verse of Genesis in the beginning, God, and the closing verse of Genesis, the last four words, a coffin in Egypt. The entire history and end of the human race, apart from redemption, is contained between the opening and closing statements of Genesis. Genesis begins with God's successful creation. Genesis ends with man's abysmal failure. Genesis begins with man in fellowship with God. Genesis ends with God's chosen people out of fellowship and down in Egypt. Genesis begins in a garden. Genesis ends in a desert. Genesis begins the history of the world with infinite divine power and glory and majesty and life. Genesis ends with human feeble power, fading glory, temporal facade of majesty of Pharaoh's house and death. Genesis begins with hope and joy and forward-moving potential. Genesis ends with hopes crushed, jaded cynicism, sliding toward the slavery of the book of Exodus. Genesis begins with a man who lived 960 years. Genesis ends with a man who lived 110 years. Genesis begins with God creating man from the dust of the ground and breathing into man a living soul. 
Genesis ends with a dying man making his relatives take an oath about his bones. But in the midst of all of that, there's a final remembrance of the promises of God. Because there is still one faithful man who clings to the divine integrity of his creator. The creator who made a covenant promise to Abraham and to Isaac and to Jacob. And he in that line clings to that promise. Joseph said unto his brethren, I die, and God will surely visit you and bring you out of this land unto the land which he sware to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. A man who clings on his deathbed to the promise of God. Oh, how many people there are who do not cling to the promises of God. Among believers even, whereby we are fearful and wonder and shake and question. Do we cling to the promises of God in life and in death? Or are we afraid? Dear people, all of us, if our Lord tarries, are going to face death someday. We can either face it in fear, we can either face it in doubt and questioning, or we can face it in faith. Knowing that we have a sovereign God who loves us, who has provided for us salvation through Jesus Christ, who guarantees that those who place their faith in him will, in fact, inherit eternal life and step from this body into the presence of the Lord. To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. Those are promises of God. Here is Joseph on his deathbed, and he is taking an oath of his brothers to carry his bones up because he says, God will surely visit you. He will take you out of this land, which is Egypt, that place where they had gone down, and he will bring you back up to the land that he promised you. And we see that 400 years later, God does it. That's what the book of Exodus is about. That's the fulfillment of the promise of God that Joseph clung to with his dying breath. Oh, for our perspective, it seems that it's taken such a very long time for God to get around to doing what God is going to do. But God keeps his promises on his timetable. How important it is for us to learn that all through history, God's people have looked forward in faith to the fulfillment of God's promises. You look through the history of Israel, the Old Testament, they're always looking forward to the coming Messiah, the promise of God. We find Abraham about 2000 BC, promises made to Abraham, promises concerning his son Judah, promises concerning the children of Judah, and the ultimate fulfillment of promises through the tribe of Judah and the coming Messiah. We find over and over and over through the Old Testament prophets as they look forward to the Messiah and they wait two thousand years. But God's faithful people never gave up their hope in the promises of God. Two thousand years they waited. And before that, the faithful had waited a previous two thousand years from Genesis 3.15 until the days of Abraham. You and I are looking for promises also. We're looking for the promise of the return of our Lord Jesus Christ. You say, it's been such a long time. God's people have suffered so badly during these last 2,000 years. You think of all the persecutions. You think of all the murder of Christians going on still in other countries around the world. But God's people are waiting. Waiting patiently and faithful. You know, throughout history, God's people have had the attitude that is expressed for us in Habakkuk chapter 2, verse 3. It says, for the vision is yet for an appointed time, 
but at the end it shall speak and not lie. Though it tarry, wait for it, because it will surely come, it will not tarry. God's people were getting tired. They were giving up. They were ready to throw in the towel. And he says, it's for an appointed time. Oh, just like the coming of Messiah was an appointed time. In the fullness of time, God sent forth His Son, made of a woman, made under the law, to redeem them that are under the law. God has precise, exact timing for every incident of history. There is a precise time that our Lord will return, just as there was a precise time that He came as the incarnate infant babe in Bethlehem. And so Habakkuk exhorts the people, The vision is yet for an appointed time, but at the end it shall speak and not lie. Though it tarry, wait for it, because it will surely come, it will not tarry. You know that book, that verse is quoted in the book of Hebrews in chapter 10 verse 37. For yet a little while, and he that shall come will come and will not tarry. And there he is speaking of the return of Christ. Quoting Habakkuk chapter 2, verse 3. You know, it's rather interesting. Uh, you may not have been familiar with that particular verse in the book of Habakkuk, but I know you're familiar with the very next verse. How often we learn verses out of their context. Do you know what the very next verse in Habakkuk is? Habakkuk 2, 4. It's a verse that's quoted over and over in the New Testament. It says, verse 4, Behold, his soul which is lifted up is not upright in him, that is, the man who's trusting in himself, the man who is vain and proud, the man who thinks that he can do it on his own, by himself. But the last phrase, but the just shall live by his faith. And that is the verse that is picked up by the Apostle Paul in Romans chapter 1, in Galatians chapter 2, and other portions of Scripture. It's the verse upon which the Protestant Reformation was built. For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. Here first in verse 3 is the exhortation not to get discouraged as you look for the return of Christ. Not to worry about the fact that God seems to be taking longer than your time schedule seemed to allow. At the end it shall not come. It shall come. Wait for it because it will surely come. And the next verse, the just shall live by faith. You see, that's the only way that you and I can live the Christian life in light of what looks like unimaginable chaos in the world around us. Many times we think, how can God be in control? Because after all, look at all that's happening. It's because God wants us to trust not our circumstances, not our national status, not our bank accounts. He wants us to trust Him. The just shall live by faith. Galatians 2.20 He puts it in the practical contents of living the Christian life. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. In the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me, and gave himself for me. Galatians 3.11 But that no man is justified by the law in the sight of God, it is evident for, and here we have Habakkuk 2.4 again, the just shall live by faith. Hebrews 10.38 Now the just shall live by faith, but if any man draw back, my soul shall have no pleasure in him. Oh, how God wants us to live by faith. And that is what God's people have done down through the centuries. We see Joseph on his deathbed clinging by faith to the promises of God. God will surely visit you and bring you up out of this land into the land that he promised. And by the way, when you go, you must not forget. Take my bones with you because that's where I belong. In the resurrection, that's where I want to rise from the dead. Take my bones with you because I believe the promises of God. Dear people, do we really believe the promises 
of God. Although it seems like a long time for us, God always keeps his promises and it's not long in light of eternity. If you take the entire history of the world, it is a blip on the screen of eternity. If you take all the way from the first verse of Genesis to the last verse of Revelation, it is but a blip on the screen of eternity, this thing that we call time. We have a God who lives in eternity. Oh, be patient in waiting for the fulfillment of his promises. The just shall live by faith. I'd like to read you a verse out of the book of Isaiah, which reminds us of that. Isaiah chapter 46, verse 13 says, I bring near my righteousness, it shall not be far off, and my salvation shall not tarry, and I will place salvation in Zion for Israel, my glory. God has promises that he gave to Israel. God has promises that he gives to us. God has a salvation that will not tarry. You trust on the Lord Jesus Christ and you are instantly transferred from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of life. From the kingdom of death into the kingdom of life. You are transferred into God's family. Out of all that lost sea of humanity that has only hell to look forward to. We're the ones who are told to wait patiently. We're the ones who are told to look forward with expectancy to God's fulfillment of promises because he will always fulfill them in his perfect timing. Have you ever stopped to think how many times the Bible tells us to wait? We're the kind of people that don't like to wait. You know, we stand in front of the microwave and say, come on, come on, come on, hurry up, hurry up. We want things instantly. We want instant gratification. We want things to be fulfilled now. We don't want it to wait any longer. We're tired of waiting. Did you know that God tells us to be patient? It's one of the fruit of the Spirit. If the Holy Spirit is working in your life, you know one of the things He's going to wait work on you? Is patience. Do you know how He accomplishes patience? The Bible tells us in the book of Romans, tribulation worketh patience. Are you sick and tired of going through the difficulties that you're facing right now? Do you know what God is developing in you by the Spirit of God? Patience. Listen to how many times the scripture tells us to wait. To wait, not just to spin our wheels, but to wait for the Lord to accomplish. What we want to do is run forward in the flesh and do it ourselves. But God tells us to wait for Him. Listen to some of these verses. I'm starting in Psalms. Psalm 27, 14. Wait on the Lord. Be of good courage and He shall strengthen thine heart. Wait, I say, on the Lord. Psalm 37, 7. Rest in the Lord and wait patiently for Him. Fret not thyself because of him who prospereth in his way, because of the man who bringeth wicked devices to pass. We want God to act right now, to stop them from doing the bad thing they're doing right now, to intervene on our behalf right now. Psalm 37, 9, two verses later, For evildoers shall be cut off, but those that wait upon the Lord shall inherit the earth. Are there some promises connected to waiting on the Lord? Yes. Look at verse 34. Wait on the Lord and keep his way, and he shall exalt thee to inherit the land when the wicked are cut off and thou shalt see it. Psalm 39, 7. And now, Lord, what wait I for? My hope is in thee. That's what you're waiting for. You know, you know the song, My hope is in the Lord who gave himself for me and paid the price of all my sin on Calvary. Our hope is in the Lord. That is why we wait on the Lord. We expect Him to intervene on our behalf in His appropriate time because He is also using the difficulties through which we go in life to fulfill in us His perfect purpose, to conform us to the image of our Lord Jesus Christ. Psalm 96, 6, let not them that wait on thee, O Lord of God of hosts, be ashamed for my sake. 
Let not those that seek thee be confounded for my sake, O God of Israel. David's prayer is that as we wait, that we not become discouraged. I suspect if I asked for a show of hands this morning, and if we were all honest in our hearts, we could all say that there was some point at which we prayed that God would do something on our behalf, and it didn't happen, and we became discouraged. Every one of us. But when we step back and look at it, with a far distant perspective, we suddenly realize God didn't answer because God had something better that he was working in our hearts to cause us to become more like Jesus Christ, to give a greater testimony and opportunity for witness, perhaps to answer that prayer farther down the road where there were other things that would be brought to his glory because of it. And so David prays, don't, when you're waiting on the Lord, become discouraged or despondent. Psalm 123, 2, behold, I love this verse, one of my favorite verses in the Psalms. Behold, as the eyes of servants look unto the hand of their masters, and the eyes of a maiden unto the hand of her mistress, so our eyes wait upon the Lord our God until that he have mercy upon us. What a beautiful graphic picture. The servant, the maid, under the total control of their master. Where do they look? Do they look someplace else for resources? Do they look someplace else for provision? Someplace else for food and clothing and housing? Someplace else to meet their needs? Where do they look? They look to the hand of their master. The one who provides for them. So our eyes wait upon thee, O Lord, our God, until he has mercy on us. Psalm 130, verse 5, I wait for the Lord. My soul doth wait, and in his word do I hope. That's faith. Faith is complete confidence in the word of God. We look to God in faith because he is the one who will meet our needs. He is the one who will provide. He is the one who will give us the encouragement that we need. Oh, how much the scripture tells us we must wait. Proverbs 20, 22, Say not thou, I will recompense evil, but wait on the Lord, and he shall save thee. We don't have to get even with those who have done us wrong, because we have a heavenly Father who is taking up our cause. He not only delivers us, but he will judge the wicked. Oh, they think it's coming long time or not coming at all. But you remember, God's timing is not our timing. God still has mercy toward even those who are wicked. And some of them he will draw to himself. Like he did with the Apostle Paul. Suppose the church had decided to get even with Paul for holding the clothes of Stephen as Stephen was martyred. Suppose they had decided, as happened to Paul later on, where the Jews had 40 men lying in wait for him to kill him, to assassinate him. Suppose the church had said, you know, we're really tired of the persecution this one guy is causing. If we get rid of Paul, why then the church will be at rest because nobody else has the zeal to persecute the church like Saul does. And so sometime before Acts chapter 9, the, the church gets together, they decide there are four guys among them that are going to defend the church, they're going to go out there, and as Paul is coming into Damascus, just before he gets to Damascus, they're going to roll big boulders down on top of him, or shoot him with bows and arrows, or come out and club him to death. Suppose the church had decided to get even. Where would most of the New Testament be? You see, God in his sovereign timing reaches down and, if we are willing to admit it, we were as evil or worse in our former life. He reaches down and he plucks the brand from the burning. And he gives us life. That is his sovereign will. And how foolishly we fret and worry about how bad the wicked are and what they're doing to us and how sorry we feel for ourselves. Oh dear people, remember this verse. Say not thou I will recompense evil, but wait on the Lord and he shall save thee. Isaiah 8, 7, And I will wait upon the Lord that hideth his face from the house of Jacob. I will look for him. 
Isaiah 40, 31, you all know this verse. But they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. And they shall walk and not faint. We like these verses. They are favorite verses. Do we believe them? Do we practice them? Chapter 49, verse 23, And kings shall be thy nursing fathers, and their queens thy nursing mothers. They shall bow down to thee with their face toward the earth, and lick up the dust of thy feet, and thou shalt know that I am the Lord, for they shall not be ashamed that wait for me. Now these are millennial promises. These are things for Israel yet in the future. And he says, the ones that wait for me, they're not going to be ashamed. This will happen someday. Jesus Christ will return to earth. Jesus Christ will set up his millennial rule. For 1,000 years he will rule on the earth. And the Gentile nation shall come and lick up the dust in Jerusalem. Israel has waited a long time. Does it mean that God will not fulfill his promises? No, but his time schedule is not the time schedule that we want. We find a little bit further. Jeremiah 14, 22. Are there any among the vanities of the Gentiles that can cause rain? Or can the heavens give showers? Art not thou he, O Lord our God? Therefore we wait upon thee, for thou hast made all these things. Jeremiah goes back to Genesis. Jeremiah reminds us that the God is the one who, who pours out the rain from heaven. God is the one who brings showers upon the earth. God is the one who, after the flood of Noah, no longer caused the, the ground to be moistened by the water that came up from underneath. God caused rain. And so when there's a need, to whom should we turn? To the God of the earth. Lamentations 3.25, the Lord is good unto them that wait for him, to the soul that seeketh him. You don't normally think of lamentations that way, but here is the exhortation that when things are tough, and they were tough in Jerusalem, there was starvation going on. Jeremiah is writing lamentations about all the horrible things that have come upon God's people. But he writes in the midst of that, the Lord is good unto them that wait for him. To the soul that seeketh him. It is good that a man should both hope and quietly wait for the salvation of the Lord. Micah carries the theme on in chapter 7 of his book. Therefore I will look unto the Lord. I will wait for the God of my salvation. My God will hear me. Zephaniah 3, Therefore wait ye upon me, saith the Lord, until that day that I rise up to the prey, for my determination is to gather the nations, that I may assemble the kingdoms to pour out upon them mine indignation. Even all my fierce anger for all the earth shall be devoured with the fire of my jealousy. Oh, we yearn to see God judge the wickedness of the earth. But we get impatient. And some people think God's not in control. Some people say, well, how come suffering exists? Why does God let it go on? God says, there will come a time when the cup of his indignation is full. And at that time, and not before, and not late, he will pour it upon the earth. Wait upon me, saith the Lord, until that day that I rise up to the prey. You see a lion crouching. And then you see the prey. You think it's there. Get it, get it, get it. He says, wait. I know precisely the time that I will rise up to the prey. And then there is no escape. Luke 12, 36. Our Lord picked up that theme. Oh, how impatient we get for Christ to return. But Jesus said, and ye yourselves like unto men that wait for their Lord, when he will return from the wedding, that when he cometh and knocketh, that may open unto him immediately. Are you waiting for the Lord? Are you watching for him? Are you carefully day by day living a life that so pleases Christ that should he come back at any moment, you will be ready. You have prepared your heart. You have prepared your life. You have prepared the work that you are doing to serve Christ. Will you be ready when he returns? 
Our Lord Jesus Christ told the apostles just before he went back to heaven that they were going to have to wait. Luke 24, 49, And behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you, but tarry ye, wait in the city of Jerusalem until you be endued with power from on high. They didn't know how long they were going to wait. It only took seven days in that case. Until the day of Pentecost was fully come and they were endowed with that power from on high and they became bold witnesses and we see the church spreading all the way through the book of Acts. We're sometimes impatient waiting for God to fulfill his promises or to deliver us. We have a good illustration of that. In 2 Kings chapter 6, verse 33, the city is surrounded, the people are starving. And while he had talked with them, behold, the messenger came down unto him and said, Behold, this evil is of the Lord. What should I wait for the Lord any longer? You know, that's the attitude of many people today. I'm not going to put up with it any longer. I'm not going to wait for God any longer. I don't think it's true because after all, you look, look what's happening around us. But God's people are able to wait through one simple word. The word faith. Did you see how many times faith showed up in those passages that I read out of the Old Testament? And then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven, and then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn, and they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. Jesus will return. We see that in all the other Gospels. Then shall they see the Son of Man coming in the clouds with power and great glory. Mark 13, 26. Luke 21, 27. Then shall they see the Son of Man coming in the cloud with power and great glory. Do you get the idea that he's coming back? Did Jesus make promises like this? He certainly did. He promised it again to the disciples just before he ascended into heaven. And we find that there's going to be the day we look at Revelation chapter 19. And after these things I heard the great voice of much people in heaven saying, Alleluia, salvation and glory and honor and power unto the Lord our God. And we find Revelation chapter 19, our Lord Jesus Christ descends from heaven. He's riding a white stallion. The sword is upon his thigh. His garment is dipped in blood. His name is called the Word of God. The second coming of Christ, end of the tribulation, just before that millennial period promised in the Old Testament. Waiting for the promises of God. That's what Joseph was doing. Joseph lives the rest of his life in Egypt. You and I are going to live the rest of our lives, our natural lives, in this world. This is like Egypt. But there is coming a day when we will be caught up in the clouds to meet the Lord. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. There is coming a day either for us to be absent from the body and present with the Lord, or coming the day where the voice of the archangel will sound forth the trump of God, the dead in Christ shall rise first, and then we which are alive and remain are going to be caught up, raptured to meet him. Those are great and precious promises, folks, and it is by faith that we look for them. Just as all the heroes of faith in Hebrews chapter 11, it's the heroes of faith. Abraham is mentioned first in verse 8. And then we find Isaac is mentioned again. And then we find Jacob is mentioned. And finally we find Joseph is mentioned. By faith Isaac blessed Jacob and Esau. By faith Jacob when he was dying blessed both the sons of Joseph. By faith Joseph when he died. And this brings us to the verses we have today. By faith Joseph when he died made mention of the departing of the children of Israel and gave commandment concerning his bones. Hebrews 11.22 is citing as the act of faith of Joseph. Many other things Joseph did that were wonderful. What does it cite about Joseph? It cites his faith on his deathbed. It cites his faith where he makes mention of the departing of children of Israel. It, acts as, it says as an act of faith when he made a commandment concerning his bones. There's a man who believed the promises of God. Oh, people, that we might believe the promises of God, because this is not just for them. Look at the last two verses of Hebrews 11. And all these, having obtained a good report through faith, received not the promise, God having provided some better thing for us, that they without us should not be made perfect. They were looking forward to the promises. They believed the word of God. They didn't get them themselves. Those things happened years after they, they were promised by God. But you know what? Paul here in Hebrews tells us 
that the list of the heroes of faith is not complete in Hebrews 11. That there are still going to be those who are added to the list of the heroes of faith. That they without us should not be made perfect or complete. That's a list that as long as God's people are on earth, they will be living by faith in the promises of God. They may not see the actual end of those promises. They may not themselves have received it yet. But the promise still stands and will be fulfilled. Oh, that is the heart of Christianity. The just shall live by faith. The early church had to wait for the promise by faith. Acts 1-4, being assembled together with them, he commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father, which saith he, ye have heard of me. The Holy Spirit is the one who empowers us to wait for the promises by faith. The Spirit also beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God, joint heirs with Christ, if so be that we suffer with him, that we may be glorified together, for I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. Paul is explaining here in Romans chapter 8 that we're going to have to go through some tough times. We're looking forward to something. The earnest expectation of the creature waiteth for the manifestation of the sons of God. For the creature was made subject to vanity, not willingly. None of us go through this kind of thing willingly. But by reason of him who has subjected the same in hope. Because, and here's the promise, the creature itself, that is the entire creation, shall also be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain together until now. Where does that take you back to? That takes you back to Genesis. Why is the entire creation groaning and prevailing in pain? Why is there suffering and death? Why are there tsunamis? Why are there whirlwinds? Why are there tornadoes and hurricanes? Why are there volcanoes? Why are there earthquakes? The whole creation groans together until now. And not only they, but ourselves also, which have the first fruits of the Spirit. Even we ourselves groan within ourselves. You are a Christian. You're still going to have some suffering. Waiting for the adoption to with the redemption of the body. Now listen to the last two verses here. Verses 24 and 25. For we're saved by hope. But hope that is seen is not hope. Just like faith that is seen is not faith, it's sight. For what a man seeth, why doth he yet hope for? Verse 25. But if we hope for that we see not, then do we with patience wait for it. You may think the train is late, but you know the train is coming. And it's coming on the schedule that is set by those who run the schedule. You sit on the platform, you've got you know, an old schedule here, and you think the train was supposed to be here five minutes ago. <laughs> and they change the schedule. God doesn't change the schedule, He just doesn't give you the exact time. He says, I'm coming, wait for it. You know the song, hold the fort for I am coming. Jesus signals still. Wave the answer back to heaven. By thy grace we will. We look for him with expectancy, with eagerness, with an earnest desire to see his face. And Paul explains it in Galatians 5, 5, for we through the Spirit wait for the hope of righteousness by faith. We wait patiently for the promise of the return of Christ and to wait for His Son from heaven, 1 Thessalonians 1.10, whom He raised from the dead, even Jesus who delivered us from the wrath to come. We wait for His Son from heaven. James tells us, Be patient therefore, brethren, under the coming of the Lord. Be patient under the coming of the Lord. Behold, the husbandman waiteth for the precious fruit of the earth and hath long patience for it until he receive the early and latter rains. Wait patiently for the coming of the Lord, looking for that blessed hope, Titus 2.13, the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Peter tells us it will be a joyful time for us, but it will be a time of terror for the world. Looking for and hasting unto the coming of the day of God, wherein the heavens being on fire shall be dissolved and the elements shall melt with a fervent heat. 
And Jude, Jude closes for us in verse 21. As you're waiting, what are you supposed to be doing? Oh, we are to be diligent about our master's business. But we sang a few moments ago about the love of God. Jude says, keep yourselves in the love of God, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. They that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Our gracious Heavenly Father, again we thank you for your word and for its power. We thank you for the blessing that you have promised in your word. And they are great and precious promises, and yet we are such an impatient people. We always want to demand that you must do something now for us. And yet you are a God who has everything under control. You are a God who still has mercy on those who are lost around us. You are a God who has given to us the privilege of sharing the word of God, for faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. You are also working to conform us to the image of your Son, Jesus Christ, through the things that we go through, the things that we don't like. The sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. Father, we pray that you will give us the spirit of faith, even as you did with Joseph on his deathbed, a book that is crumbling to ruins in the world around all the things that are bad. Egypt is there. The brothers are there, these very bad guys. Jacob has just died. Oh, what a glorious beginning in the beginning God. Oh, what a feeble and wretched end. A coffin in Egypt. And yet Joseph dies with the words of faith on his lips. God will surely visit you and bring you out of this land into the land that he promised. Father, give us the eye of faith and cause us to walk consistently and faithfully looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.